Another E3 has come and gone, but come on, you know us. We're only getting started covering it all. And that starts with our analysis of the Zelda Wii U trailer. So it's time to kickstart the old analysis machine and see what secrets the Zelda U trailer has in store. But because we're operating at such a tight timetable, Derek and I are actually going to double team this one. So let's get started. But before we get to the footage itself, the game's director, Eiji Aonuma, reveals some tantalizing details about the game itself. Specifically, that they're basing the experience on the gameplay style of the original Legend of Zelda, which offered a completely non-linear world, allowing you to go almost anywhere at any time, as opposed to more recent 3D Zeldas, which have been largely linear, with defined entrances and exits into each area. So Aonuma made it clear that this is no longer the case, as you'll now be able to enter any area from any direction in any order. This is basically Zelda's take in Skyrim's open world. And to back this up, Al Numa showed a scene taking place in real time that depicts just how vast the world in Zelda Wii U really is. And that's to say, it's huge. Never before in a Zelda game have we been able to see so far. And yet, according to Al Numa, you can travel to any point that you can see here, even those distant mountains. And because of this, Al Numa states that the puzzle solving will begin from the very start. From the moment that the player decides where to go, then in figuring out how to get there, and what exactly they'll do once they do get there. It's basically taking the puzzle elements of Zelda to a worldwide level, perhaps suggesting that even entering an area from different directions could influence the course of events that follow. The possibilities really are as endless as the world itself appears to be here. And speaking of the world, let's take some time to explore the many details hidden within it. And of course, we have to talk about the lovely field of grass first. I mean, just look at it. It's not only vast, but the blades even sway convincingly in the wind. Then there's the fact that you even see the shadows of clouds rolling across the landscape, casting darkness on anything to pass over, including the trees here. Now, this entire scene also appears to take place at dawn, with morning mist lingering just above the ground, and the reflection of a low-hanging sun can be seen in a nearby lake. Plus, the intense bloom lighting on the left also kind of gives the rising sun away. But the fact that it's set in the morning does suggest that the time of day will change throughout the game, much as it has throughout the Zelda series, so no real surprise there. But, throughout the gameplay footage we've seen, we can see that the time of day never actually changes. Even though the scene does cut at several points, the longest unabridged shot is more than 30 seconds long, and shows what appears to be a static time of day whereas in past Zelda games, morning lasted but just a few seconds. So that could mean one of a couple things. For one, maybe the time of day freezes at certain points in the game, such as this point here. Or maybe the time of day has actually been greatly extended, which would make sense that the world truly is that much larger. After all, the day-night cycle before helped lend a small world a more epic feeling, one that a larger world wouldn't necessarily need. For example, a full day cycle in Skyrim takes about an hour in real time. So we could see Zelda Wii U doing something similar. But that's enough about the sun, as there are a ton of other details hidden in the field too such as the villagers working away. There's two on the left and another on the right, and they're joined by some grazing goats nearby. And that's just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to details. But for the rest of them, let's switch over to a direct feed screenshot from the game. And not just that, but let's enhance it too. Analysis machine, enhance. So you might have noticed a large house here, plus a couple more on the right, and a well can be found nearby too, along with some walls here. Also, there appears to be a unique tree here as well, that can't be found anywhere else in this location, unlike the other trees nearby. Does it have any special significance? And just behind that village are these odd pillar structures, but we have no clue what they might be for. Now to the right of the small village is a tall wooden structure, complete with a windmill weather vane on top. And we think that based on its height, and the fact that it features staircases and ladders leading to the top, it may just be a lookout point. Now looking farther out, we can see some cliffs on the right side that loom high over the ground, along with even more mountainous terrain on the right. And on the left side, we can see a lake with what appears to be a water gate, or a barricade of some kind running through it. And behind that, we can see what appears to be one of several forests visible in just this area alone. And the later scene offers a hint of what these forests might look like, with light filtering in through the trees, in what might be more limited structured environments. But the really interesting thing is this pyramid-like structure here. Could this be a temple? And it looks like we might be able to see the entrance on the left side. So perhaps you have to make your way through the forest to reach it. Now, if we look even farther out, we can see some kind of ravine. And it looks like it may be a pretty intimidating passage to cross through. And speaking of intimidating, on the opposite side of the world, we can see a smoldering volcanic peak that might just be Death Mountain. But this time it appears to be surrounded by what looks to be desert, which would be an interesting change. And just in front of it, you can see what appears to be a settlement or at least some kind of structure. And if you zoom in real close on the area between the two, we can see what might be some kind of town. Or maybe even Hyrule Castle. In fact, you can almost make out what might be one of the castle's famous blue spires. Now the setting here appears to be rather peaceful, which suggests a world that, at least for now, is largely unaffected by Ganon or evil forces in general. But that doesn't mean everything's peachy keen, as it's not long before some kind of monster appears on the scene. But we'll have more on him soon. What's more interesting for now is what happens leading up to it. You can first hear a soft boom in the distance, followed by some rustling trees, which causes a flock of birds to fly the coop. And all of this catches the attention of both Link and his horse, causing them to turn their heads. Even the goats nearby stop eating for a few moments to look at what just happened. Link's horse then rears back and appears to be scared of what might happen next, and with good reason. And the horse's reaction actually freaks out the goats on the left, causing them to scatter. And it's about at this time that the ones on the right take notice of the giant creature before skedaddling too, followed shortly by the nearby villager. 
And did you notice how even the grass reacts to the shockwave caused by the monster's energy blasts? This is all a pretty awesome level of detail that truly conveys that this is a living, breathing world. Well, at least it is until the monster blasts the poor villagers on the left here to smithereens. Or so it seems, at least. And it even charves the ground, too. And because of that, we can't help but wonder the lingering fire might actually continue to grow in size, similar to the brush fires in Far Cry 2. As for the monster itself, we can see its head rotating nearly 360 degrees, as if it's scanning the environment immediately after emerging. And based on its aim, it seems as if it may be targeting people, first going for the villagers on the left, before taking aim at Link's original position. It then chases Link into the forest, leading into an action-packed segment full of details all its own. But I'm far too spent to tackle all of that, so take it away, Derek. As the monster chases Link into the forest, we can see even more details that this world has to offer. The woods are lined with ruins depicting animal-like beings, one even resembles a snake with a human face. We can see its long body that ends in a sunken eye, a nose, and even a mouth with pronounced lips. The other has an almost dragon look to it. Unfortunately, we have no idea what these statues could be in reference to, but the fact that they're covered in moss means that they're quite old at the very least. Along with what's inside the forest, the forest itself is quite detailed with light filtering through the trees and even realistic shadows appearing on the forest floor. The peaceful scene is interrupted by the monster firing its laser at Link. The laser appears to go off into the distance before the explosions are set off, but it seems that the laser actually skims the ground. These points explode, sending out more rocks and rubble. It happens again as it chases Link into the foreground. The sheer power of this creature is demonstrated as it collides with a rock wall that shatters around the monster, yet it appears to be unfazed. But could this mean that there are destructible environments in Zelda Wii U? It seems to be the case as it later destroys a bridge, preventing Link from running further. The animations in this sequence even show Link's horse leaning into the sharp turn, Link looking back to see if he lost the creature after the turn, and even Link turning to watch the monster pass him by. However, what's most curious is the fact that the forest looks more closed off than the open field before. There's a specific path that you can follow and the ruins almost serve as a funnel to lead you down the road. We're curious if Link could have run in a different direction through the woods to escape, or if the monster and terrain was designed to lead him in this specific direction. It looks to be the latter though as the side view of the path in the next scene shows terrain that seems impassable. We do wonder if there's a way to explore the hole in the side of the rock in the background that the water flows through. But let's get back to the monster who has quite a few details worth noting in his design. Looking closely, we can see that its entire upper body is covered in grass and moss. We can even see that this foliage shakes in the wind as the creature moves. The question is, was this simply camouflage or something else? Camouflage is possible simply because its mechanical legs are in much better condition than the rest of it. There's no way for that to blend in, so maybe they were hidden underground until it was ready to attack. But with the sheer amount of power that it obviously wields, why would it need to hide itself? Another possibility is that the moss formed naturally over time. The enemy could have been asleep for ages before being awoken by something and attacking whatever happened to be close. In this case, Link and his village. But Link himself may be the biggest mystery in this trailer. Even his appearance threw fans off as it appeared to be incredibly feminine. His soft facial features, ponytail, and even the fact that his main weapon looks to be a bow made many believe that this character is a girl. While it hasn't been 100% confirmed or denied, Awanuma has made it sound like Link is still a boy. What has us more interested is everything else about him. The cloak he throws off has strange symbols imprinted on it. We have no idea what they could mean, though. They don't seem to have a basis in anything from previous Zelda games, so they might be directly related to Link's village. This is supported by the fact that the rest of his clothing appears to bear similar designs. The other thing to note is that Link is not in his traditional green tunic, which likely means that this scene takes place toward the beginning of the game. Link often has different origins that set the tone for the rest of the game, and in the case of Zelda Wii U, we believe that he might live in a hunter culture. Link is already incredibly proficient at using his bow, so much so that we see him smoothly pulling out two bomb arrows at the same time. He doesn't fire them at the same time, but he's able to hold one while shooting the other. If he's from a hunter culture, it would explain his preference for a bow and general combat abilities. It might even be why his hair is pulled back into a ponytail, mainly to keep his hair out of his eyes when using his bow. But strangely, there's also not a single hint of him using a sword. It's not on him at any point, and it doesn't even seem to be a factor. Could players actually choose a weapon specialization in the game? Or is it simply that Link hasn't obtained a sword yet? The only clue to a sword at all is the fact that a shield is hanging from his horse. But the horse is carrying more than just his shield. It also has several saddlebags, a blanket, and the special arrow. Could your horse be used to carry more items thanks to the saddlebags? 
and could the blanket be used for setting up a camp in order to quickly pass the time? It would fit in with this massive world that Nintendo was touting. Link's position in the village may even be dedicated to protecting this area by taking on roving monsters. He could act as a scout that intercepts them before they could do any damage. This position may be emphasized because of his weaponry. Link isn't just using normal arrows, but multiple arrow types, namely the bomb arrows and the seemingly futuristic one. These seem to be odd choices for just hunting. The blue arrow certainly stands out in terms of design and the question of exactly what it's used for. At the very least, it's highly specialized since Link has it stored directly upon his horse rather than in his quiver with the rest of his arrows. It even has a different colored feather to help differentiate it further. The arrow isn't activated right away though. Link actually has to pull a trigger to activate the blue light. And when the blue light appears, we couldn't help but notice how the design of this arrow was incredibly similar to the monster itself. Namely that it uses a blue energy as its source of power and that its body is covered with swirling patterns and glowing red circles. It even has the same blue energy ring that appears when it's preparing to fire. If these do indeed have the same design, then it's possible that Link can gather crafting materials from defeated enemies in order to create unique weapons. Or could it be that both the enemy and the arrow are based on the same technology, possibly suggesting that this technology plays a large role in the game? Link also only possesses one of these, which means that he could be limited by the amount of materials he has. As for what this arrow can do, we believe that it can pierce thick shields or body plating that an enemy might possess, especially since the bomb arrows that Link uses only seems to stun the monster at best. There's no way to tell for sure though as the trailer ends before we can see it strike. There is one last maneuver Link pulls off though. He leaps from his horse to an incredible distance by the horse actually rearing up to give him a boost into the air. It could be a game mechanic that helps Link start a battle with a super strong attack. Even though we know that this trailer was created using an in-game engine, we do wonder if all of this is indicative of actual gameplay or filmed to be more cinematic in nature. The different angles, the destructible environments, and Link's abilities could just be spiced up to make things more interesting. It's hard to say for sure, but cinematics are often indicators of how a game actually plays. But what about the story? We've already said that we believe Link is either a protector of his village or even a hunter. As we look through the trailer, we couldn't help but notice several things that are incredibly similar to the classic Studio Ghibli movie, Princess Mononoke. Prince Ashitaka rides a steed and is well known for wearing blue. Link starts off with a horse and is also wearing blue. The people of Ashitaka's village wear farming attire and keep an eye out for danger from a wooden watchtower. Likewise, the villagers near Link are wearing similar clothing and seem to be farmers or shepherds. And there's even a nearby wooden watchtower. Visually, Ashitaka sports a topknot and uses a bow as his weapon in order to take down an invading monster. While it's not a topknot, Link does have an uncharacteristic ponytail and uses his bow to take down the rampaging monster. So we can't help but wonder if the incident somehow causes Link to be exiled just like Ashitaka. As a symbol of his shame, he cuts off his topknot and leaves the village to search the world. Perhaps Link does the same and sets out into this huge version of Hyrule to see what caused the monster attack. After all, the moss on the monster did make it seem like it had been sleeping for ages. Going a step further, could this take place after Zelda 2 on the NES? Ganon was seemingly defeated for good at the end of that game, though that's never stopped him from appearing again. It would explain the overgrown ruins and the sheer scale of Hyrule. Of course, this is likely not the case at all. After all, we did point out how similar Link's arrow is to the creature's design. If this is the first one he's ever encountered, how did he get the materials in the first place? Unless he was able to find that technology separately from the monster. But even setting aside the story, The Legend of Zelda for Wii U looks to have an incredible amount of potential. So with that, we've covered all that we could find in Zelda Wii U's debut trailer. It might be a while until the next bit of information is released, but the old analysis machine will be ready to go whenever it does happen. Until then, if you liked this video, please be sure to like us on Facebook or follow us on Twitter at GameXplain. Thanks for watching and be sure to stay tuned for more on Zelda and other things gaming too.